Welcome everybody to the Defence Sector uh, Virtual Workshop for the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. Uh, this is, is a recording of an event that we held on Thursday the 23rd of April. I have re-recorded the first 15 minutes or so of the meeting because there was some background noise when we were going live, uh, but for the rest of it you will hear everything uh, as it happened. So uh, my name is Sue Kay and I am the Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61. And uh, the reason that uh, we're holding this meeting is because I was involved in putting together the first Robotics Roadmap for Australia and we're here to talk about version 2 of that roadmap and in particular to talk about the Defence chapter of the Robotics Roadmap. So the way that we will run today is that I'll spend uh, the first 30 minutes setting the scene for why we're looking at doing version 2 of the roadmap and giving you a bit of a history of the first version of the roadmap. And then I'm going to be handing over to some of my co-chairs. I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of my co-chairs, Dr Jason Schultz, who will lead us through the second half of the workshop, uh, Dr. Marcus Hellyer from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, who will talk to us about defence strategy. Uh, Commander Paul Hornsby from the Royal Australian Navy, who will talk about robots in the Navy. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Robin Smith, who will tell us about robots in the Army. Wing Commander Michael Gann, who will talk to us about uh, robots in the Royal Australian Air Force. Uh, and we'll also be joined by Dr. Brendan Anderson, who will lead us team. Just to give you a bit of background on um, the first robotics roadmap for Australia, um, the history to this was uh, that a few years ago I um, was fortunate enough to be involved in the creation of the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision. The Australian Centre for Robotic Vision is an Australian government funded centre of excellence that was put together to uh, really combine the fields of robotics and computer vision because these were areas where it was recognised that Australia had some strength. And when I was working with the centre I noticed that many other countries had roadmaps and indeed had quite detailed strategies around robotics and AI uh, but I couldn't find anything for Australia. So I asked around and I heard from a few people within the robotics community that at various stages people had considered putting a roadmap together but for a variety of reasons uh, they never one had never actually emerged. Um, at the time, we were also very fortunate that the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision had on its advisory board Professor Henrik Christensen from the University of California, San Diego, who has essentially led the development of all three of the US robotics roadmaps. And so I was fortunate to spend some time with Henrik uh, to really go through the process that he followed for putting the US robotics roadmap together. And the US robotics roadmap is a quite a success story. There have been three versions so far. And by the time they got to the second version of the US robotics roadmap, uh, they were able to gain more than $100 million in funding for robotics research in the US uh, based on the awareness raising that had occurred as part of putting that roadmap together. They were very fortunate in that there was a, a congressional committee that was devoted to looking at the impact of robotics technology at the time. And so they um, had, did a really great job of having a direct line of communication with some important decision makers in the federal government. Now, obviously, governments change, and at the moment, that situation is different in the US, and that congressional committee no longer exists. So it will be interesting to see how things develop from there. But Certainly the roadmap has had an influential um, role in the development of uh, robotics policy and also in leading a lot of robotics research and development in the US. Now, uh, so we've followed the model for putting together the Australian roadmap very closely on the one for the US, which involved having a series of workshops um, across the country. In our case, that's going to be virtual at the moment. Uh, that lead into um, particular parts of the economy that are important to the, to the nation in question. 
and uh, really trying to get um, feedback on what it is that robotics can contribute into different important sectors of the Australian economy. One of the first things that we found when we started to put the roadmap together was that Australia really isn't using robots or other artificial intelligence at the same rate as many of our peer nations. So if you have a look at us compared to the US, there are far fewer Australian firms engaged in automation. And um, another very common measure of how much different countries are adopting robots um, is a measure put together by the International Federation of Robotics, which is called the Robot Population Density of a Country. So you can see that Australia has a robot population density of 80 robots per 10,000 employees. Uh, which is a bit below world average and puts us ranking at 23rd, um, which is not last, so that's a good thing. Um, and I should point out that these are specifically industrial robots. So industrial robots are the type of robots that you would typically find on the manufacturing um, floor or factory floor um, and are quite different to service robots, which you might think of as a robot that you might find as a concierge in a hotel or an educational toy, or uh, even a robot vacuum cleaner in a factory. So these numbers are specifically around industrial robots. As you can see, uh, the world's number one country is Korea, which has 710 robots per 10,000 people. So the Korean economy is quite different to the Australian economy, and they have a very well-established electrical component manufacturing sector, which lends itself to the use of industrial robots. However, I still don't think that really explains why Australia um, sits relatively low in terms of those rankings. And why that's important is because, uh, as I mentioned before, many other countries have very well established robotics and AI strategies that their countries are implementing, including one of our near neighbours, China. And China has the uh, stated ambition of becoming the world's number one country in terms of world robot population density by this year, which means that they intend to overtake Korea in the number of industrial robots that they have. And if you do a bit of a back of the envelope calculation about how many robots that involves, if 710 robots per 10,000 employees in China are in use, then that means that they will have more robots than the populate, human population in Australia. So that's a lot of robots. And China has also paid a lot of attention to how they can make sure that they have a sovereign capability in the production of their robots. So some of you may know that a few years ago, China purchased a, a industrial robot manufacturing company called KUKA, um, which had originally been German based. And they are very um, focused on making sure that they can supply their own and the reason that this is important to China is to make sure that their manufacturing sector um, remains efficient and competitive. And another reason that that's important to Australia is in terms of our actual productivity. So um, for many years now, Australia has had a fairly constant rate of labour productivity and it's grown annually by about 1.8% we need for our productivity to be growing at 2.5% every year just for us to maintain our standard of living. That's to maintain our standard of living, that's not to improve it. And the main way that you can um, bridge the gap between labour productivity and general productivity in general is by applying technology. And robotics and automation is an obvious choice for helping to bridge that gap in, a, in an efficient manner. So we really need to be looking at how Australia can get better at adopting uh, new technologies such as robotic technologies and also how we can be the creators of those technologies uh, to make sure that we can maintain our current standard of living. And really there's never been a more um, perfect time to be involved in robotics because unlike the development of many other new technologies, there is actually a very positive public sentiment around the use of robots. And 58% of people think that robots will have a positive impact on 
society. So that's a really good place for us to be. Um, clearly, it would be a lot more difficult for us to convince people of the benefits of using robotic technology if the majority of the, our society felt that that was a good thing. And the other thing that we discovered as we were putting together the roadmap was actually what an exceptional um, bunch of different Australian companies were already doing great things in the field of robotics. So um, Australia already leads the world in the automation of our mine sites. Uh, there are companies uh, such as XM2, uh, which is pictured in the, at the top middle of this picture, who uh, are um, a drone cinematography company that have been responsible for some of the amazing footage that was included in films such as the Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, in the middle right hand side is a, a company called Marathon Robotics that supplies uh, robots for helping to train many of our first responders in how to respond to live fire. And as you can see, these companies span a whole range of sectors from construction through to agriculture. And Australia really should be rightfully proud of many of the fantastic, um, uh, fantastic talent and technologies that we're already producing in the field. important facet of trying to put the first roadmap together was uh, looking at how we could map the capability that currently exists in Australia in robotics and automation. And when I use the word term robotics, I use that in a very broad sense. So this is not just about uh, people who build robots, this is about the people who are involved in automation or helping or who are integrators who help companies to take on these technologies but also many robotics related technologies, such as computer vision, the development of sensing systems, um, motion capture interpretation. So we used all of those key words in looking at Australian companies and uh, the red dots on the map there actually identify uh, the companies that we were able to identify as having some capability in the formation of robotics or robotics related technology. The reason that it's important for us to know what our capability is in robotics is that it's very hard for us to have a conversation with, with any sort of influential decision maker if we can't, just, if we can't actually um, reasonably accurately define what the robotics industry in Australia currently looks like. And I think it would be fair to say that before the first robotics roadmap for Australia, we really didn't have a clear picture of what the robotics industry looked like. And I still think we have a long way to go. Now, one of the reasons for that is that the Australian Bureau of Statistics doesn't collect any data on uh, specifically around robotics or robotics related companies. And that's because robotics can influence all sectors of the Australian economy. So you might find some robotics companies who uh, fit within the broad category of manufacturing, but many of them will fit in the services sector or will feed into specific sectors such as the mining industry. So it's very hard to get a handle on the ones that are actually um, focused mainly on robotics or robotics related technology. So this was our first attempt at trying to get numbers on how many companies and what their value to the Australian economy is. Because again, that's a very important consideration when talking to decision makers, particularly within the government, about why they should care about whether Australia is producing robotics related technology or not. Is it important to the Australian economy? So let's have a look. What we found, and we believe this is really an underestimate um, based on the information that we were able to get our hands on, is that there are more than a thousand companies in Australia that are operating in the robotics uh, or robotics related space, and that they employ more than 50,000 people, and that they, were, they are uh, and again, conservatively, we believe, worth more than $12 billion in revenue to the Australian economy. We were unable to get figures that would help us unpick how much of that might be export-related revenue, um, so that's a task for us in the future. And the large um, bubbles uh, there that you see on the map of Australia are really just giving an indication of some of the uh, signs of the level of robotic activity in different states in Australia and there's probably no surprises there. The size of the bubbles is very much related to the size of the population of each of those areas. 
And this was the final product that we released in mid-2018. Um, so you can find a copy of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia on the internet if you are interested in downloading it, or you can get in contact uh, with me if you'd like to receive a hard copy version. And I think uh, the Robotics Roadmap, the very first one, did a good job of starting to raise awareness within Australia that we do produce robotics technology and that there are a number of companies involved and that perhaps this is an area that we should be paying more focus to. Roadmap put out a range of more than 18 recommendations, which we grouped according to the different areas that they influence. So we had some recommendations for industry, for our education sector, some specific recommendations for how government could be supporting a robotics industry in the country, um, recommendations for our research and development sector, and also many recommendations around the type of culture that uh, we really need to within Australia uh, to help to support a strong robotics industry in Australia, um, including, I, I guess, really having um, the imagination to think through how we can use a lot of these uh, technologies to help us to solve uh, challenges that are unique to Australia. And looking at the defence sector in particular, um, this is probably one of the most important areas uh, for robotics in Australia because there is such a high level of investment in defence and also because it is so important in terms of the exports um, that are generated. Um, there are a very large number of small to medium sized enterprises involved in uh, the defence supply chain and it employs more than 70,000 people. So it's a very important um, sector and one that is one of the most advanced sectors in terms of how it applies robotics and automation. So a lot that many of the other sectors can learn from. And I think it's also important to note that um, you know, the Australian government has stated that they have an aim to spend 2% of Australia's gross domestic product towards um, developing new technologies uh, that will support or on the defence sector and that will involve the production of new technologies. It will be encouraging the development of new technologies. So it also, the defence sector represents a fantastic opportunity for the robotics sector. So I apologise this diagram uh, might take a little bit of time to get your head around, so I'll talk you through it a little bit, but it really is a representation of the um, importance to the Australian economy of many different sectors. So on the left hand side, uh, the large purple circle is uh, really um, looking at the areas where Australia invests funds. And as you can see, uh, we invest uh, $28.5 billion into defence and more than $5.2 billion into national security. On the right hand side of the circle in blue is um, how much many sectors are worth in terms of revenue for Australia. Um, so you can see healthcare, for example, sits on both sides of the circle. It is both an investment by Australia, but it is also an area where we generate quite a lot of revenue. Um, and you can see from the size of those um, dark blue circles, what value each of these sectors represents the Australian economy. And you can also see that um, each of these uh, parts of the circle um, have been given different colours. And this is just a shorthand way of giving an idea of how much robotics and um, automation technologies are already being adopted in each sector. And you can see that in Australia, it is our defence, our manufacturing and our resources sectors who are really leading the way in terms of having a mature capability in the adoption of uh, many robotics and robotics related technologies. Um, and so again, that underscores the importance of um, us having a good handle on what uh, are the opportunities for robotics in defence because these more mature sectors are the ones that will lead the way for many of the other sectors. As you can see, there are some sectors, the ones in red, where we very rarely see the adoption of robotics related technologies. These are things like uh, the environment, uh, personal and social services and in the construction industry. Um, and it's likely that for some of those sectors that are, um, are not very mature, 
that we'll actually see quite big changes in the future as they start to follow the lead of many of the sectors that are already in the mature category, such as defence. Another important uh, piece of feedback that we got as we were running the roadmap workshops was that there was really quite a hunger for information for people to be able to absorb information from one sector into their own sector. And again, I guess this goes to the way that we do partition things into sectors, uh, which can in some ways be helpful, but in some ways can actually be quite restricting. So, um, you know, it's unlikely that many manufacturers would turn up to resources um, conferences because that's just the way that we define ourselves. Um, but people, there was a recognition that we could learn a lot if we're able to actually diffuse some of the information and learnings that um, some sectors have developed in terms of how they adopt robotics technologies and we're able to transfer that information to other sectors. And I can't say that we actually have an answer for how you could best do that. But what we do know is that uh, just by virtue of putting something together like the roadmap where people can uh, dip in and have a look at how other sectors are applying robotics technology, that this is one way that we can help with that diffusion. But I think there's more work that we can do in this area. And another finding from the first roadmap, um, in having a look at how many other countries have uh, structured and supported their robotics industry, is the importance of creating technology clusters. And in the case of manufacturing, this can be used to help with mass customization and even trying to reshore jobs back to Australia. When I talk about robotics clusters or technology clusters, uh, these really have to be in close geographic proximity. So this is an example of a cluster that's considered very successful, um, which is located in Pittsburgh in the United States of America, where many technology companies have clustered in very close proximity. And what that means is that it gives a really great opportunity for a, a particular geographic area to really harness the talent and technologies that are currently being developed and make sure that they remain in the area and that the area actually grows its critical mass. Um, in the case of Pittsburgh, a lot of people now move to Pittsburgh who are in the tech industry because they know that they can get a job. Um, at a range of different organisations. It's not just a, a one company town. And the other benefit of that is while people aren't stealing um, intellectual property from one company and transferring it to the next, you do have a natural flow of talent from one company to another, which means leads to the upskilling of all of the companies in the area. So I think this is something that we should be aspiring to in Australia so that we can ensure that much of the talent and technology that we're developing in this country can actually be um, applied in this company and that there can be reasons for people to remain in Australia. And uh, as a result of the first robotics roadmap, we've actually led to the development um, of a Queensland robotics cluster. This is still in the early stages of development uh, but it's a very positive sign um, of one of the first steps towards starting to bring Australia's robotic industry um, together in a cohesive fashion. Following on from the creation of the robotics roadmap, um, there have been a, a couple of other reports that, that have come out that you might be interested. While I was at uh, QUT, where the Australian Centre for Robotic Vision is based, we commissioned a report. Uh, which looked at the economic impact of robotics and automation specifically for the state of Queensland. And while Queensland does have some features of its economy that are um, unique to Queensland, I think most of the lessons that uh, really have been learnt from uh, that report are applicable to all states in Australia. Um, Alpha Beta, which is an economic consulting firm, has also put together a, a specific analysis of the importance of robotics and automation to our um, mining and resource sectors. So if you haven't seen those reports, uh, you might be interested to get one. And just to give you a preview of what some of the results, at least for the um, Queensland economic analysis, are concerned is that even with a fairly modest predictions of annual growth, that the application of robotic and automation technologies to the, Queen, to the state of Queensland were worth significant um, uh, improvements 
in terms of the gross state product, so worth an additional 77 billion over the next 10 years. Um, but importantly, you can see that there are a huge number of jobs created, 724 and 725,000 jobs, uh, which is in excess of the jobs that were expected to be created at the same state um, over the next decade. And that's important because uh, you probably are aware that many of the newspaper headlines would suggest that uh, robots lead to automatic job destruction. But most of the economic analyses that I've seen actually suggest the opposite, that robots actually lead to job creation. The important thing to consider though is that many of these jobs are new jobs and uh, that it does require that people are given plenty of support to be able to transition out of the more traditional jobs into these new jobs. Um, but in terms of the overall number of jobs available, it is actually would actually lead to an increase. But the other important thing that this report highlighted, and it's been highlighted in um, reports um, around the application of artificial intelligence related technologies, is that Australia's opportunity in both artificial intelligence and robotics is very time limited. And so Although we can accrue significant benefits by the adoption of robotic and automation related technologies in Australia, we're only going to accrue those benefits if we um, are able to adopt those technologies quickly. So if we defer the decision to uh, do something to start to increase adoption, uh, then we will not accrue those benefits and we will really be forever behind other countries in ability to leverage the opportunities developed. And so some of the outcomes from the roadmap, um, it received widespread uptake, more than 7 million impressions on social media. I believe that if you uh, look at the number of inquiries that many of us involved in the first roadmap together get, there has been a, a definite increase in awareness of, of robotics and the impact it have on the Australian economy. Um, the Six Wave Alliance uh, was an attempt to start to get a bit of a national network going by CSIRO's Data61, and we're now converting that into the Robotics Australia Network. Um, as I previously showed, we've developed a Queensland robotics cluster. I think we've started to change that narrative around job creation. This was something that Senator Kim Carr recognised at the launch of the roadmap. And our Australia's chief scientist, who was also at the roadmap launch, um, really distilled a lot of the messages from the roadmap into three key messages, which was that for many of Australia's traditional industries, uh, such as mining and manufacturing, really are high tech. Um, Australia is often thought of as not really having a, a tech sector, but that's uh, not so not true that it is many of our traditional industries that are building our tech capacity and we need to recognise that. And that obviously we need a more diverse workforce or we're missing out on 50% of our talent. The other thing that was really uh, quite a pleasure to um, discover in putting the roadmap together were just some of the range of examples of things that I think most Australians would rightfully be proud of. Um, where we were able to show that Australia had led the world in the development of different aspects of, of robotic technology. And um, I think that is something that it, we need to see more of. Um, the robotics industry in Australia might be quite immature and uh, fragmented at the moment, um, but I think there are a number of fantastic success stories and we need to make sure that these are visible because I think it's also fair to say that the robotics industry in Australia to date has been very invisible. So the reason that, that we're looking to go to a version two of the roadmap is really to keep the momentum going, to make sure that we maintain um, people's awareness of robotics and increase awareness. We really need to flesh out many of our projections of what is required from robotic technology over the next five, 10 and 15 years. Um, and be able to identify where it is that Australia can make a difference. So there are some areas where it might just make sense for us to use um, developments uh, from other parts of the world, but there are also areas where um, we can use um, our natural abilities.
We really need to keep unearthing much of the capability that exists in Australia. Much of that capability does reside with small to medium sized enterprises uh, who don't necessarily have time to come along to workshops like this. And uh, so in many respects will remain invisible until uh, we can unearth that capability. Um, and the ultimate goal, of course, is to make sure that we can establish a clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia. And given that we have had to move these workshops to a virtual format, we have put together a survey that I encourage you to fill in. So if you feel that you don't have the opportunity to contribute during this workshop, um, that you can have your say and give us some um, idea of where you think the robotics industry in Australia could lead. Now, uh, for those of you um, joining the live session, you'll know that um, we were fielding many questions from the chat window. Uh, but at this point, I will hand over to Dr. Jason Schultz, who is the CEO of the Trusted Autonomous Systems Defence Cooperative Research Centre, to take us through the next part of the workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Thanks very much for uh your introduction and uh, especially for the recap of the uh, first roadmap and uh, some of the things which are compelling uh, the, the development of a second, uh, a revision and second roadmap. So um, I'll be chairing this second part, which will be over the next 30 minutes. Uh, because we are recording, uh, we're asking people to please hold their questions uh, till the end uh, so we can do a continuous record and then uh, probably take the recording off for the Q&A session at the end. So um, this will be about 30 minutes. Uh, I'd like to introduce Simon Ung. He'll be assisting me in adjudicating uh, the questions, because if we do have a lot of questions, uh, there are likely to be too many more than we can handle. So he's going to help sort them through. So uh, as Sue said, would you please, uh, in the meantime, if an, a question comes up, would you please type that into the chat and uh, Simon will take a look through to uh, try and work that out uh, as we near the end of this part. Uh, and as Sue said, please fill in the survey um, because we just don't have time for everyone to have a voice uh, in this. Um, the survey will be an important instrument to get your thoughts and feedback. So uh, the defence uh, sector of this roadmap um, as Sue said, uh, Defence does have clear strategy, but the fact is that they, the Defence does lack coordination of that strategy uh, internally in a sense. So what I'm saying is that you won't see a single roadmap in Defence at this stage, and it's more or less based by service as in Army, Navy, Air. There is also a joint area, uh, which is which tends to generally deal with more like the common things that are areas of common, like for example, a common control system across robotics or uh, the use or access to spectrum, which is of common interest across all services. Um, so I just wanted to mention that up front. So the structure then over the next uh, uh, short while will be uh, Dr. Marcus Hellyer from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute uh, representing some thoughts here related to defence strategy and to get uh, an external and frank view, I think, on uh, on robotics uh, and uh, autonomous systems. So, uh, Marcus, would you like to unmute and uh, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Marcus, are you there? Um, am I there now? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, sorry. I stress when I'm from artificial intelligence through to what systems, um, and I'm going to be primarily about military capability rather than uh, sort of industrial capability per se. Uh, can, you, can you still hear me? Okay. 
Yes, Marcus, yes, it's okay. Sorry. It's been a bit broke, broken up to start with, but. All right. Well, I guess I did group. Roadmap or autonomous systems. Uh, some of the services have some documentation, but it tends to be, in my view, fairly uh, high level uh, collections of and adjectives. It's not a plan per se. So there's the Army um, Robotics and Autonomous Systems Strategy. Robotics and autonomous systems are not one of those 10 categories. So they're sort of scattered very broadly across defence capability and across defence uh, industry capability. So I guess what I would say is the result of that record has been pretty mixed in terms of progressing autonomous systems. Uh, Army's doing quite a lot of stuff, but at a kind of tactical level. So providing tactical UAVs to its soldiers. Again, Navy is working again at the kind of tactical level using autonomous systems for mine clearance and hydro um, and sort of fairly tactical UAVs. And Air Force, um, without putting too fine a point on it, is not really doing anything. It doesn't have, as far as I can tell, any UAVs at the moment. And, you know, if you're going to be really critical, you'd say that Air Force is about 15 years behind um, other Western Air Forces in terms of bringing in autonomous systems. So, and we seem to be arriving in this space just as other countries such as the US are deciding they might move on to something else. So, uh, it's kind of a mixed record, which isn't to criticise individuals, but I think it says something about the, the high level culture and structure of defence that it really is not promoting uh, innovation and imagination in this space. Uh, overall, I'd say the defence, what defence does with autonomous systems is to supplement people. Um, it's not really looking at replacing manned platforms at this point. So um, it's moving towards sort of manned, unmanned teaming slowly but a kind of future of using a lot of autonomous platforms to, or systems to replace, replace platforms and get people off the battlefield is still a long way away. And I guess the, the overall challenge, I think, for defence is uh, the, I noticed Sue used the, brought up the imagination word in her presentation. And I'd say that that is the challenge facing defence, is how to unleash uh, the imagination of the people in defence and how to empower that imagination. I think one of the key uh, problems facing defence is when um, it looks at autonomous systems, it always through the of assessing it as a direct like-for-like -like replacement for a manned system. So historically, defence has replaced old man platforms with new man platforms. And it, when it looks at UAVs or autonomous systems, it looks at them through that mirror. And of course, they come up short. You know, there is no uh, un autonomous underwater vessel that can currently do what a submarine does. But uh, so defence tends to... Um, I guess be quite critical of them rather than uh, looking at them in terms of what disruptive potential they have. So they may not replace a submarine, but they can do very different things to a submarine and potentially make a submarine's life very um, difficult. Uh, so I think uh, what defence needs rather than actual formal roadmaps is, is a way to kind of unleash the creativity of its people the, pr the problem is, is there's this kind of dead hand of the current investment program. So, so much of Defence's current investment is being directed into uh, traditional manned platforms, whether it's submarines, frigates, joint strike fighter, coming down the track uh, is armies, armoured vehicles. Those things are going to... Um, they tend to, I think, suck a lot of the oxygen out of defence in terms of looking at where it should be going. So there's kind of, they're a bit of a dead hand sitting on uh, defence in terms of innovation. So I think defence needs to find a way to kind of, again, open up space for innovation and investment. Uh, <clears throat> 
I guess, you know, the question is, well, how, how could you do things differently? Um, that's a very good question. But I think if we look at, say, the United States Navy, you know, the United States Navy has realised it, we can't keep going down this path of building increasingly uh, expensive manned platforms that are multi-role designed to defeat every single threat out there to protect the very valuable humans in those platforms, which just continues to drive up the cost of manned platforms exponentially, which means we have fewer and fewer of, of them. And so the US Navy has been going around this boy for some time, One and it's, it seems to have accepted it's never going to have the ships it needs and so it is much more actively pursuing uh, autonomous platforms and so it's got a number of plat programs going which are uh, experimental you know but relying on concepts so not just on the technology but a whole bunch of supporting concepts uh, such as you know distributed lethality so to try and break that um, pathway of moving Platforms to disaggregate capabilities. So every system does not a thing. And I think that um, is something that uh, here in Australia the defence needs to consider much more actively as well. So it, it does not look at it as an, an autonomous system as doing everything that a manned system does, but only a small subset. And that way we can build um, new um, distributed, whether you call them swarms or aggregate, aggregates of uh, individual systems rather than incredibly complex platforms. So, um, you know, I don't say that as a criticism of individuals in defence. I know there's a lot of people in defence doing really great work um, systems in defence and I commend them for it, but I think what's needed more broadly across defence is a kind of cultural shift, you know, to have, have much more uh, open way of engaging with autonomous systems. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Marcus. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll move straight on to the next presenter. Uh, Commander Paul Hornsby re representing Navy. Are you uh, able to unmute now, please, and uh, take the mic? Thanks, uh, Jason. Can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. If you... Great. Uh, look, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, Thank you, Marcus. Look, I'll, I'll start with this because we must have heard you. I know uh, my boss is listening on this. So um, uh, to unleash that imagination, in fact, Navy has recently created the Warfare Innovation for Navy branch uh, and to do exactly as you suggest. So I won't go into the details and address those uh, uh, those individual items. Other than so Marcus, we, we, um, I, we hear and uh, the creation of the Warfare Innovation branch of which uh, autonomous uh, systems are a part is a great step forward. Um, what I would like to do is, Sue, so that was a great presentation. And I've got to say that in developing our program strategies, our execution plans in the autonomous space, um, we drew heavily on uh, that roadmap, the last vision, version. And I've got to say, I was delighted to be part of it. And, uh, and I'll come to a particular uh, pieces of that, it, you know, um, because it certainly uh, inspired the imagination about how broad this was, you know, from resources to services to healthcare and, of course, defence. Now, I guess um, what Navy has, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said, uh, I'm the Navy lead for autonomous uh, warfare systems. And I can say that we uh, sort of approach this, you know, over the last three decades, approach this in reverse. So we've got some very sophisticated projects around. We've, uh, we certainly have a, a, a well-developed draft execution plan, and now we're uh, bringing that up to a program strategy. Um, now, one thing you will know is that uh, just after the last roadmap was launched, uh, DST and Navy uh, led uh, a, a unique activity called Autonomous Warrior. In fact, the roadmap even refers to it. And what, what uh, impressed me was the number of synergies uh, in running that exercise. So I, I led Autonomous Warrior with, uh, you know, with the great uh, authorship of uh, Jason Scholes on this. And my talk the synergies, well, I was talking to, for example, Marine Park authorities, 
who really saw the benefit of some of the things we were doing in rapid environmental assessment that had synergies to what the sort of data and the uh, the improvements that could uh, happen in the environmental sector and our engagement with regulators, um, you know, CASA, AMSA, CASA, the others. Um, and, uh, but I want to come to what we drew off the roadmap and uh, in, in developing, dra in drafting a program strategy that isn't the least, um, I, I spoke to, uh, we looked at it in multi-domain, so both from uh, what was unique about Australia, Sir Thomas Worry, was that it was the first time in the world, and it's still the large end of its kind, that looked at all the mains and all the services. So air, surface, subsurface, ground, cyber, space. Um, a lot, in fact, a lot of the participants in Autonomous Warrior came straight out of the mining sector, uh, where some of those uh, synergies for uh, taking on the dull, dirty and dangerous we really uh, worked out. So in terms of addressing uh, Sue's point about building technology sectors, it's interesting to look at some of the really big players in the autonomous game. The, you know, the Boeings, the, the Northrop Grumman's, the Lockheed Martins, people like that. And when you look at them, they have four lines of effort. And I've, in my recommendation for consideration in the redraft, in, in the next uh, version of the roadmap, would be to look at this because big, big companies look at it in terms of four things. Um, in terms of platforms, uh, in terms of payloads, in terms of what we call command and control, you know, making it goes to the right place at the right time and stopping at the right place in the right time, and something that's unique to autonomous and robotic systems, and that's interoperability. And uh, that's about collaborative behaviours, because unlike, and I'll use warships as an example, but you can refer to it in Air Force or Army, um, the unique, probably one of the, the bigger features and benefits of uh, robotic and autonomous systems is that they are designed or should be designed to be interoperable. Now that can be applied to any sector, whether it's resources, healthcare, or whatever. Um, but there is a, and so you go to any major uh, defense contractor and they'll have a vice president for platforms, a vice president for payloads, a vice president for command and control, and a vice president for interoperability. And, and we look to their best practice because they're in it for, you know, they're in it to, to make the bottom line. So it is worthy of consideration when looking at the roadmap, how you might cluster people working on the platforms, you know, whether, you know, whether they're ground vehicles or uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, looking at people, you know, the sensitive packages that go into what we call payloads, uh, the control systems, and uh, also people who work specifically with the interoperability. And the interoperability is about that AI and supporting AI. And that leads into engaging with proper engagement uh, with the right regulator at the right time. And of course, of course, the ethics that we're all uh, cognizant of and feeling. Now, that, is, that brings in a fifth element. The fifth element is what, uh, uh, and there are new phrases for this, that's the human autonomy team. So that's, that's striking the right balance of workforce with robotics. It is, um, I, I know there are other phrases for human autonomy teaming, but it's not always uh, the same. So certainly in defense, we look at, and in conducting autonomous work, there are times when things are so busy that it's beyond human endurance or human response time. And you really want to crank up the robotics and crank up the autonomy and crank up the AI. There are other times where you draw it back. So it's not a constant. So my recommendation uh, for consideration in the next iteration of the roadmap is uh, you know, you've got five, five lines of effort. Platforms, payloads, command and control, interoperability, and human autonomy teaming. And I think that probably covers it. Uh, probably overrun my five minutes. Um, but uh, that's our view, and Marcus, I assure you, we uh, uh, you know, we are definitely uh, moving really quickly in the innovation space. And so, uh, yeah, keep us honest. Thanks. Uh, that's about it for me. Subject to your questions. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we'll hold the questions again. Sorry, we'll hold the questions till the end. Um, I do wish to. Um, uh, just check to see if uh, Wing Commander 
Michael Gann is actually here. I see someone named Michael, but uh, not Michael Gann. So I'm not sure. My Michael, are you here? Uh, I am. Can you hear me, Jason? I can. Thank you. Fantastic that you could make it. Um, uh, I'll hand over to you for a five minute uh, viewpoint from uh, Air Force. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jason. Also, thank you, uh, Sue, for the introductions. Also, thanks for the previous speakers for your comments are always always very welcome. It's good having a workshop uh, such as this one where you can uh, get frank comments out. So from the Air Force perspective, I'll be as uh, brief as possible, noticing that, as usual, Paul has taken all my time. The uh, from the uh, from the Air Force side of things, um, I guess we approach the concept of robotics from two angles. So we have a, uh, a, a large investment program. Uh, which we uh, which you develop our capability through, and inside that are some key programs coming up, such as the Air 7003 uh, Sky Guardian armed medium altitude long endurance um, unmanned air vehicle, or unmanned or unmanned air system, and also the uh, MQ4 Charlie uh, Triton, uh, which will be part of a, uh, a system maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, the system being the MQ-4 Triton, as well as the P-8 Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft. So uh, both those systems are unmanned. Uh, they're not autonomous. They are unmanned uh, and they are in advance of current systems being operated by um, the Western Allies at the moment. Uh, in between, we have a um, we have some technology demonstrators, the pro most prominent being the Royal Wingman uh, Boeing um, air power teaming system, another uh, unmanned vehicle, semi-autonomous, uh, which is a technology demonstrator we are we are doing with Boeing in Australia on a vehicle which is engineered and produced in Australia as well. So that's the on the big big side of things, and that's that's we consider those uh, as Marcus correctly pointed out, um, much as we would consider a manned aircraft. So it's part of the integrated investment plan. It has a similar sort of interoperability requirements that Paul talked about, um, and it has a key place in in our in our long term strategy and the defence white paper. Um, in that. Now, below that, we do have a, a significant jump where uh, we're looking at both uh, autonomous and um, remote control systems uh, for the rest of our environment, which is not in the big end of the high end of the air, but it's on the ground. So we're looking at a number of systems, including a, a, uh, a small robot, um, small logistics bot moving around spare parts within a headquarters environment. We trialed a uh, autonomous ground vehicle moving uh, um, parts around a, a flight line, also using things like um, commercial off-the-shelf drones to do um, to do overhead inspections of C-17 aircraft. So we do have a number of programs in there, but they are certainly technology demonstrators. And what we seek to learn from those programs is, uh, as Paul said, how they interoperate with our current systems, but also how they um, how they interoperate with our um, with the with the people. So there's a uh, piece in that which is very important. But uh, particularly, uh, and this is a good segue for the next speaker, uh, our ground requirements are very similar to uh, found in the Australian Army. Uh, so we plan to be very close to the Australian program that we're looking at and uh, sharing a lot of information on the requirements and the lessons learnt uh, on those smaller systems that aren't at the top end of the IOP. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, now over to Army, Lieutenant Colonel Robin Smith, are you on the line? Yeah, hi Jason, I'm, I'm here, can you hear me? Thank you, yes, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, I'm just really conscious of the time and uh, the time available for questions at the end is rapidly compressing. So uh, firstly, uh, at the risk of sounding like a defense of Army's robotic and autonomous system strategy, I don't necessarily recognize the picture painted uh, by Marcus earlier on. Um, our RAS strategy was uh, was put out late 18, early 19, uh, and it tried to outline the effects that Army was trying to get out of robotic and autonomous systems. Clearly, autonomous systems are supported by AI, so in, implicit within uh, the requirement for autonomy is, is a level of machine learning and AI. What we're trying to get out of it is we're trying to remove soldiers from some of the most dangerous tasks on the battlefield uh, where we can, um, and to also increase our effectiveness our lethality, our decision making. And also there is clearly a role in the non-deployed space uh, in terms of improving our efficiency, uh, our simulation, our training. Um, so the RAS strategy sought to try and bring that together. Putting that out in the same way that Sue described the roadmap um, 
for, for robotics, uh, did act as a catalyst uh, for concept development. Uh, and we're moving on with experimentation and prototyping, trying to improve the visibility of robotic systems to soldiers to try and get those ideas, get those innovations, to get the creative juices flowing. And believe me, there are no end of good ideas. There are no end of bad ideas as well. Um, and um, in 2019, we embarked on a, um, a physical experimentation program. So we experimented with Australian built and produced unmanned ground vehicles uh, in different roles, both in the deployed space and around the barracks with a multitude of different units. And we learned a lot from that uh, activity. We've explored legged robots uh, and the role of legged robots within uh, the urban environment in particular, where we see their most value. Um, we have uh, went through a research agreement. Um, we have developed a really compelling leader follower capability, which we hope to expose more widely in the, in the short term. Uh, it shows a great deal of promise. Uh, and we also enhance some of our current platforms uh, with some fairly rudimentary autonomy, but making them robotic nevertheless, uh, to try and demonstrate uh, conceptually where the value comes from um, some of our current platforms and how we might be able to do things differently in the future. Uh, the RAS strategy is also spawned from the soldier combat system, um, the human machine teaming uh, project that's running there. And that has now gone out uh, more widely. There's a discussion paper, there was an industry seminar, uh, the combat applications lab is now being created uh, and an expression of interest for companies to uh, contribute to the Humpty project has gone out there. So that's what we've done in the past 12 months. Uh, looking ahead now into 2020, uh, we're going to be uh, continuing along the lines uh, that we currently have with Leader Follower, where we hope to grow the capability into a larger number of vehicles. Uh, the optionally crewed combat vehicle idea, which is using the 113 as a surrogate platform um, to experiment with, uh, we will be growing that fleet and continuing to expand the experimentation there. Uh, we're starting now to explore uh, the role of AI in our decision making and how we can improve our decision making uh, at the tactical and operational levels. Um, perhaps more importantly, uh, we recognize or Army has recognized the need to take a more programmatic approach to this. And so it's created the RAS Implementation and Coordination Office, the RICO, uh, great name. I wish I thought of it. Um, and that will uh, start to bring together those projects and plans across the land capability division and act as that interface with our, uh, our friends and colleagues that we've been collaborating with over the last 12 months. Um, what's more important is the use cases within the IIP are now starting to see a greater influence of robotic and autonomous systems, the role of autonomy in those future need statements. Now, they, they might not be making it out into industry yet, but believe me, they're on the way. And so um, I would sort of close soon with uh, just highlighting that the collaboration and the community of interest that sits around robotics, many of which are the people that sat uh, right in front of me, although virtually right now, uh, has been amazing. And we have learned a lot from many, many different industries. Um, Army has a strategic partnership uh, with a number of industries, and we are harvesting that regularly uh, to try and make us better informed, to try and understand where the value comes from robotic and autonomous systems and where we can express ourselves in terms of needs better to help to seed uh, industry, uh, both small, medium and large um, scale. There are still a number of issues though that still need to be fixed. Um, trust, trust in autonomous and robotic systems in particular, trust that they'll work properly, trust that they'll always work, trust that they can't be interfered with, trust that they won't hurt us. Um, we have learned a lot over the past 12 months about safety what it means to operate with and among robotic systems, particularly in the ground domain, this is quite demanding, um, uh, particularly when we want to operate around soldiers and around populations, uh, there are still a number of challenges there. Uh, clearly, there are ethical issues associated with autonomy and what we will and will not automate, um, and uh, the value and risk in terms of cyber uh, from networks and networking. So I guess I would summarize by saying I think we've got growing momentum, particularly in Army, but working with Air Force and Navy uh, and DST and our academic and industry colleagues. Um, I think we must not lose sight of getting the right robot for the right task with the right level of autonomy. One size doesn't fit all. The beauty of a human is they can do multiple things. Robots are much less uh, broad. And then finally, um, 
you know, we the uh, RAS strategy that we put out where we looked at enhancing our current systems, augmenting our systems, and then finally replacing them with fully uh, robotic systems, if that was appropriate in the future, uh, still stands um, and as a, a valuable um, identification last year, uh, and we're still pursuing down that road. Uh, I think I covered quite a lot of ground there, but I just don't want to take too much time. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Robin. Much appreciated. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for your attention. So the last step stage here is uh, some Q&A. Um, so what I will do is hand over to uh, Dr. Simon Ng to just uh, have a look at some of the questions and perhaps Simon read, read uh, make a choice and uh, read one out uh, if they're directed to a specific um, presenter or uh, we can open it up to the presenters to answer. Thank you. Uh, no problem. So can everybody hear me? Can you hear me, Jason? OK, good. All right. So um, I will paraphrase some of these. Uh, there are a few that have just come in. I'll have a quick look at those in a minute. So I guess this is a, this is a broad one uh, directed at the whole panel. Uh, how is the white paper considering robotics? And in particular, how is it considering robotics as part of a mix of manned and unmanned systems? Do you want me to answer that, uh, Jason or Robin or uh, Gaz? Yes, you want me? To... Yeah. Um, look, I, let's go back to the previous white paper, sixteen. Now it uh, it covered off, and certainly it's in the integrated investment plan, which uh, Sue, in fact, just showed you, and in fact, is covered in far more detail actually in the first uh, version of uh, uh, the roadmap. So, and that was a, that was a really good feature of the last roadmap. Uh, that it included the great investment plan that came out of the previous white paper. Now, where do we, since then, the, you know, since then, obviously, uh, I think, you know, the importance, the emergence of disruptive technologies like uh, robotic and autonomous systems and the supporting AI have become more poignant. So you would be aware, of, or for people's uh, yeah, uh, knowledge, there is currently a force structure plan uh, going through. These are these are normally interim to any white paper. I would. Uh, this is a really broad uh, answer, but uh, I I'm pretty confident in saying that that will see uh, a, good, a greater emphasis on robotic systems and their supporting AI. Is that too? Uh, you know, um, so yeah. It, it Thanks, Paul. Sure. Uh, any other responses to that? I think I'll just highlight the fact that as the technology becomes more mature and we have input into the capability, um, I think we will likely see that our user needs will be more clearly defined uh, and therefore we will be able to be in a much better position to really articulate in great detail what it is that uh, particularly ARMY, from my perspective, would wish to get out of a specific robotic system. Okay, if there are no more um, uh, responses to that, I'll move on. Uh, there, were, there was a lot of talk uh, by you, Paul, about Autonomous Warrior 2018 and, and the success story uh, that that represents. Uh, uh, this is, I guess, again to all the panellists, how is Defence going to help that robotics pool or that innovation pool by uh, having another AW18 or an equivalent? Thanks, uh, Simon. Uh, we are we are developing a role Thomas Warrior program, which will link into um, our existing exercise schedules. This is, uh, and I'll pick up on what uh, uh, Colonel Smith just said there. What Robin just said was that this will this is going to get people more familiar with uh, uh, robotic uh, systems. Uh, so that that will be a, a rolling program. We're heavily involved in uh, coordinating, budgeting, sorting that out. So uh, watch this space. It is uh, um, uh, that's how we're approaching it. Rather than uh, you know, in the future, we will look at having sort of the large event we uh, undertook in 2018. Um, so yeah, we're, we're yeah we're getting uh, we're, this is two two edged uh, approach. Not only are we uh, engaging with industry to get get them to come forward with their innovative ideas, which are really good, you know, and they're going through the Defence Innovation Hub uh, or through the DCRC or uh, other ways and means. Um, 
but uh, this allows actually the users to get familiar with that interoperability. Anyone else want to speak to that? No? Okay, so uh, this was another question that came through uh, really about the roadmap and to what extent the roadmap is going to look at options for uh, unified software frameworks. Um, ROS is one example, RG Pilot, I think uh, Sue, you mentioned, um, and open communication protocols as something that can enhance both interoperability, but also um, uh, collaboration and the effectiveness of collaboration. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, yeah, I've asked Ricardo, is he volunteering? Because yes, it would be good to have more detail on that. And I'm very happy for people to uh, help me put that together, which is a danger of submitting questions on this chat channel. But I've sent Ricardo my, my email address and hopefully we can follow that up. But yeah, definitely. Does anyone else want to make any comments? No? Okay. Um, so let's uh, move on. Um, there was a, a question here. Um, I'll, I'll just read the question out. Uh, will robotic systems that are being acquired by ADF come under the framework, framework of extant technical regulatory and safety management frameworks? To that one. The short answer, yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, and there are no, we, we did this, we are doing this with the Autonomous Warrior Program. It, uh, we, we, were, we were very fortunate to, for uh, the different regulating bodies to go with us. Are there gaps in that? Absolutely. The, the opportunities, particularly in the assurance of artificial intelligence and the regulation of that, that's, uh, that, that is a space that, uh, it uh, needs you know, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work, a lot of opportunities, uh, but yeah, it's fundamental uh, that uh, you know, when we look at uh, how we evaluate uh, any system, particularly at the end of the day when we accept it into service, is it safe? And that goes to an entire network of safety cases, regulatory systems that we currently use, uh, classification societies that we use in some cases. Uh, uh, yeah, so the answer is yes. I'd also, I'd also add that to a degree we've got to we've got to help to change some of those frameworks. We've got to do that by articulating what it is that we want to do. Um, and so, you know, if we want to take a autonomous vehicle that is following another vehicle, for instance, so it's autonomous but it's having its its lead provided elsewhere. How do we how do we go around getting that thing on the road? How do we go around getting that thing to be deployed in the field? What does the tech reg framework look like uh, fitting a robotic and autonomous kit to an extant platform? Uh, how do we grow some of the requirements to move larger loads by air using UAS? We we know the kind of questions to ask, um, but we've got to get moving in terms of helping both the national regulatory framework and our defence safety framework come together so that we can get the capability that we are seeking to try and get. Uh, it's, it's a mix of technology and, um, and regulation at the same time. I'll certainly back up both um, Robin and Paul's comments on, yes, the systems that we are bringing in are, are going to be definitely um, in accordance with our national and our national regulations and our in, international expectations. Uh, the comment I will make as, as with Robin, uh, the current trend, the reality is that uh, robotic systems and autonomous systems, the social expectation is that they will actually be better than the humans or the human systems, which they will replace. So that we do have a social expectation that we are very aware of, uh, that we will actually uh, increase that capability, we'll have safer systems uh, than those that they're replacing. And I would add on one more uh, point to both uh, Robin and uh, Michael is that uh, um, some of the regulatory uh, are, are responding very quickly. Uh, AMSA, the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, actually changed some of the rules as an outcome of the autonomous warrior. 
Great, thanks guys. Uh, there have been a couple of questions really to do with skilling and training, the implications for defence when it comes to deploying autonomous and robotic systems. So I guess the, the general question being asked is, is how is defence looking at that matter of skilling and training? And what do they think the impacts will be as we move towards increasing levels of autonomy for the, the skill and training set within, within defence? I mean, I'd, I'd cover that just in, in the broadest sense. Um, there's, there's a number of aspects to it. Firstly, there is the, uh, is the awareness and education aspect of, of what, is, uh, what does autonomous systems mean? What, what does it mean? What does AI mean? What is it? Uh, accepting there are no international agreements and therefore getting those who are creating user need requirements to articulate uh, in, a, in a proper sense what it is that we want and what are the arts of the possible on the other side, of course, is the, is the operators. Um, now, we can build a system to be very operator friendly. That's, that's um, good. Um, however, the maintenance and the sustainment of those becomes much more challenging. And I think this is where we'll start to see potentially some of the shift in the balance of the workforce uh, away um, from some of the traditional skills into the more what are currently niche skills, but will become to, need to become more mainstream skills, uh, software engineers, mechatronic engineers, uh, those who are currently not um, largely resident in defence, and we need to take a look at how do we how do we build that workforce. If we need a we need a sergeant uh, in eight years' time who's a mechatronics or software engineer, we need to recruit him today. So how do we how do we even ask for the right thing because we don't know what it is that we want, or do we have to open ourselves to a more lateral flow uh, from industry, from academia, uh, and elsewhere? in at the appropriate level. So we're employing a person for their technical capability, not necessarily for their uh, command and leadership capability. And at the moment, our ranks, our pay, uh, and um, our positional authority, if you like, is all mixed up uh, together. And perhaps this sort of technology starts to disrupt that. So we want to pay somebody as a sergeant, but we don't need them to be a sergeant from a command and leadership perspective. And at the moment, we just need to look at how we do that. In support of what uh, Robin Absolutely, yeah. Particularly drawing from uh, areas that we wouldn't in our normal sort of training development schemes. Uh, Navy, for example, has just stood up a category uh, um, uh, with their own badge for um, uh, UAVs. Now, we won't draw those necessarily just from uh, traditional pilots, etc., uh, or just from uh, sort of the warfare categories. We're going to draw those from the technical and engineering categories who. who have a, you know, a great synergy with these systems. So yeah, the, those uh, Robin's point about drawing from non-traditional areas is a really good one. And uh, I like to think we're responding to it pretty quickly. Uh, Simon, just conscious of the time, um, perhaps uh, just one last question and we have a short wrap up from Sue. Uh, yeah, no, no problems. Um, let me select from these. So I guess uh, perhaps Sue, this is um, this is really directed at the roadmap itself, uh, and it was a question about the relationship between embodied intelligence or robotics, as as we tend to call it, and and AI. Um, and it point the 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 person who wrote this question pointed out that these are becoming increasingly coupled areas. Uh, to what extent does a roadmap need to to adapt and encompass AI and or relate to an AI roadmap as part of giving us a, uh, a broader context for robotics in Australia? Um, I think that, you know, we're obviously robotics is broadly part of AI and, uh, you know, we're broad, more broadly part of the, the tech sector and the more that we can be seeing um, strategies and actions that support uh, the development of an AI industry and more broadly a tech industry in Australia are all helpful to uh, supporting a robotics industry. Um, I do think though that there is a need for our community to have uh, our own roadmap and it really is following the pattern that exists in other countries. So I think that sometimes we can get a bit lost in discussions when it's more broadly AI um, and uh, I think having a focus on on how that AI is de deployed out in the physical environment is important. 
Um, so yes, it would be good to have that uh, actually associated with um, an AI strategy, but I'm a little bit unclear at the moment who is really uh, taking a lead on doing that at the moment. Um, uh, but obviously it'd be good if we could do that. And uh, look, a good example of where we have been able to cross pollinate, I mean, apart from defence has been um, with the space agency. So we're undertaking a, a collaborative process to put the space chapter of the robotics roadmap together. Um, and uh, the ASA were already looking at a strategy for robotics and remote operations. So we're actively working together to try and make that happen. Um, I guess if anyone has any contacts, uh, you know, that we need to include so, so that we can also try and be part of that broader AI strategy, that would be good to know. Thanks, Sue. So that, that uh, wraps up the questions and I'll take the rest of these questions and circulate back to you for you to get out of session responses. Great. Thanks yeah. a lot, Simon. Um, anything else you want to say in a wrap up, Sue? No, not really. Just to remind everyone that, uh, you know, we apologise that, uh, you know, by moving to a virtual format, you know, it's been difficult for everyone to, you know, have, uh, you know, potentially a lot of say, but we do have that survey, which Simon circulated the link to earlier. And if you registered on Eventbrite, you'll also have that link. We'll also make sure that it's more widely circulated through all of our networks. Um, so please feel free to have your say by participating in the survey, um, or you can just get in touch with us. Um, and uh, thank you everyone for participating. And thank you very much to my co-chairs. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks.